My reasons for the choice of, of these particular lessons is I believe for business graduates to succeed as managers, if that is what they choose to do, they must become effective in addressing the basic day-to-day -day issues involving people. Now, some refer to managing people as a soft skill. Well, soft it may be, but trust me, if you want to manage successfully, and in particular, should you work in an international environment, you must develop the ability to deal effectively and responsibly with people. My experience in business is that success with hearts and minds ultimately trumps functional skills. If a single word can describe my unplanned career in business, it is serendipity, happy accident. Overwhelmingly for me, the stints of accidental employment were happy. I have been and continue to be a very fortunate person. A characteristic shared by all my managerial jobs is that the companies were in crisis, financial, operational, and in one instance, governance. Additionally, all, in different ways, had a governmental dimension. When at age 38, I was appointed as the managing director of a fairly large British company, I had not managed anything except projects. At CP, I had always been in a staff job. But when I was Toronto-based, the regional vice president, a man called Les Smith, had other ideas. He was always called the boss by me and everybody else. And he was a keen developer of young people and had many instructions as to how managers should operate and behave. One mantra was, walk the property, be seen, and get known. Consequently, on my first day at Cavalaird, not being entirely sure what to do, I thought a good start would be to walk the property. As I said, it was a big shipyard. Being from Canadian Pacific, I asked for a boiler suit and a hard hat. Uh, that was a little difficult. My predecessor had never had any. So having obtained these, I proceeded to walk around and introduce myself. Without exception, those to whom I spoke were at a virtual loss for words. I boarded a bulk carrier which was in the wet basin fitting out. Now, because of the extreme tides in the River Mersey, once the vessel was launched, it was towed around in the wet basin at high tide, and then, having been secured there, a, a gate was pushed across the end to keep the water in the west, wet basin so it would float as the tide in the river went up and down. I went into the accommodation block of this bulk carrier, and looking into the cabins, found a man fitting a side light, a window. So I said, good morning. Uh, there wasn't any reply. Uh, I spent enough time in ships with CP, I thought, bugger's probably deaf. So I raised my voice and, and then said, good morning again. And he turned around and asked if I was speaking to him. I replied that since there were only two of us in the cabin, uh, the answer was yes. He looked at me and then said, I know who you are. And then he said, I've been in this shipyard for more than 25 years, and you are the first gaffer who has ever spoken to me. Not knowing what else to do, we shook hands. That was... I'm sure for him, as it was for me, a very emotional moment. But was it any wonder that the effing shipyard was in difficulty? <laughs> Thereafter, when I was not traveling, I did my walk about twice a day, rain or shine. Some three months later, on the Friday before the annual general meeting scheduled for the following Tuesday, I fired five senior managers for cause. 
The cause was the fabrication of production numbers in various areas of expenditure so as to present positions materially different from actual. They were lying, but simply lying on paper. I told the five the terms of their dismissal. Interesting, not one decided to contest the dismissal. Shortly afterward, I was having one of my irregular meetings with Mrs. Thatcher, and the whole of my series of meetings with her over many years, we always met in her parlor. I, I like to think there's some significance for that, but I've never been able to determine what it was. Um, she referred to the dismissals and asked the reasons, so I gave her a few examples. Her only comment was, of course they were deceitful, and I suspect they had been for some time. That is one of the reasons you were brought in. Prime Minister was always ahead of the curve, and this was no exception. Trimming the truth or being economical with it is an old technique. And from the start of my relationship with her, I invariably gave her the facts as I knew them and expressed my views and judgments respectfully but frankly. And I dealt similarly with the Secretary of State for Industry. Early on, uh, a very senior civil servant suggested that I might be better served if I were to be not so frank and if I endeavored to coach my opinions in more neutral language. Um, I can't be what I am not, so I declined. Sometime later, I learned from one of Mrs. T's ministers that she had said she could rely on me to say what I thought not what I thought she wanted to hear. The lesson is that, morality aside, truth is an excellent tool. One need not be rude or aggressive, merely truthful. Without color commentary or context, let me quickly tell you four other simple lessons I learned. The first is very basic, particularly when contending with banks and creditors. And I suspect some of you will simply nod that lesson is under promise, over deliver. The actual results will be what they will be, but if you can promise less and deliver more, you both buy time and importantly, your credibility is enhanced. The second lesson I learned from an experienced Dutch industrial manager, a man called Jim Menge. He called it panicokum, or pancaking, referring to flattening the organizational structure. My experience translated this into my rule of six. No more than six layers between me and the shop floor, and no more than six direct reports to me or anybody else. I found that effectively this eliminated the clay layer of middle management which too frequently stands between a plan and its execution. The third applies if and when you're the boss. Always have at least one person who's usually in a staff position whom you both like and trust who will tell you things you may not wish to hear. When told, listen carefully and reflect. The fourth, hopefully, you will neither have to learn nor apply. If you work in circumstances in which you may be at some risk to person, take that possibility seriously, learn appropriate behaviors, always rely on professional life advice, and avoid the amateurs like the plague. 